Dr. Cunningham, who is going to give us the fourth lesson in his holiness series. Thank you, Brother Thorpe. Praise the Lord, everybody. He already asked you, you're glad to be in God's house tonight. I believe you are. Got a good crowd here tonight. Thank the Lord for that. The, there are exciting things happening all over the United Pentecostal Church, and I am so thankful for what God is doing in our world and doing in our churches, doing for our people right now. It's quite a blessing, and I'm thankful for it. I've been getting letters, got one yesterday, got one today, pretty much every day since Fivefold Ministry. I've got some kind of correspondence from a pastor or church that was here of how it has impacted their life and impacted their church. There's a number of them that are saying that they picked up a blessing from the Lord here. The letter I got today and yesterday and one last week, I know those three come to mind. I think there's maybe even more than that. But a number of churches have told me they've gone home and every single Sunday since they were here, They've had somebody baptized and get the Holy Ghost. That the revival we're having jumped on them. And I'm thankful for that. Can you say amen? amen? I always am happy when Bible World Church gets to minister to a lot of people like that. And uh, I believe that God ties very, very special blessings uh, to us doing things that are not necessarily for us, but it's us trying to minister and help and minister to and help other people. And when we do that, I believe there's a special blessing goes with that. And so uh, part of the blessings we have on Bible World Church is because this church is so unselfish. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. Brother Thorpe talked about our new statistics we just got yesterday. Brother James, is James back there? Brother James gave these to me yesterday. In the past 28 days, that's not even a full month yet, but in the past 28 days, you, you, you want to put your seatbelt on for what I'm fixing to tell you. In the past 28 days, we have had 105,000 views on Bible World's YouTube page. 105,000 views. We have 1,200 new subscribers. I don't know how many subscribers we have total, but we're picking up, we were picking up two or 300 a month, but in the last 28 days, we picked up 1,200. And the interesting thing about subscribers is that when they subscribe to our YouTube channel, it means everything we post, they get notified that it's coming up. So a subscriber is a big deal. And uh, there's several thousand, probably 10,000 or more that are subscribers. Do you know James Ballpark? 11,000 subscribers. That means they're getting notification every time, like right now that we're doing Bible study. They get a notification of Sunday morning, Sunday night, a special conference we're having. So I appreciate that. And a lot of people say, well, you had 105,000 views, but probably they're only on there a minute, probably only on there two minutes. So they check that. And in the last 28 days, we've had 40,000 hours of views on our site. 40,000 hours. That ought to make you happy. Praise God. There is Brooklyn and Ashton coming in. Don't you love them? Thank God for them. And little Lincoln, did you, did you show him Sunday night? Stand up and show him, or, or, or I want you to look, folks. That's a miracle right there. That is a miracle baby. Looky there. All right. Ashton, you need to be thankful he come out looking like he's mama. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy of what God is doing for his people. 
I, I know there's problems. I know there's situations. I know our world's in a mess. I know you're paying more for everything and there's a lot of fear going on in our world about wars and rumors of war and all that kind of stuff. But do you know that in the midst of all of it, God is blessing his people? Amen. How many of you have been blessed by the Lord? Would you testify with just waving your hand? God's been good to us, hadn't he? Amen, 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 amen. I want to remind you before I start Bible study that evangelist Mark Dross will be with us Sunday morning and Sunday night. We're not going to be meeting here Friday night or Saturday, either one, but Sunday morning and Sunday night. Brother Mark Dross will be preaching here. Now listen very carefully. He is an evangelist. He's at the top of his game. I shouldn't talk about ministry, about being top of your game. But he is being greatly used by God. People are getting the Holy Ghost. People are being baptized. People are being healed. God is using him. He's a man of great faith. And he travels all over the world. It's not... It's not uh, odd for me to get a text from him on a Monday. Say, oh, Brother Cam, yesterday I was in Mexico City and 730 got the Holy Ghost. Or yesterday I was in El Salvador. Or yesterday I was in Europe. Or yesterday I was in Dallas, Texas. And it's always some great big thing that God has done. I want him to send out a text this Monday to everybody else. I was just at Bible World. And guess what God did at Bible World? Amen. Praise God. Now, here's what's got to happen. I, I, I went with my Uncle Bill one time to preach, and a guy got up, the pastor. He was a great guy, but had, had, I don't know if he had a lot of faith or just a lot of something. But he got up in the pulpit and said, 50 people's going to get the Holy Ghost here tonight. 50 people. Billy Cole's here preaching. And when he came back and sat down, my Uncle Bill said, you got 50 people here, 50 guests? that need the Holy Ghost? The guy said, no, there's seven or eight. So how are you going to have 50 get the Holy Ghost if there's only seven or eight here that don't have it? I don't think that even qualifies as faith. It qualifies as something else. <laughs> I'm telling you that story to tell you that what happens Sunday is going to be dependent upon how many people we can get here that need something from God. I want to challenge you to invite guests and friends and family and co-workers and you young people, thrilled to have you in here tonight. Go back to school tomorrow and Friday and invite your friends at school to come with you to church on Sunday. Invite your neighbors to come. Let's do everything in our power. Anybody's teaching a Bible study, please make sure your Bible study's in church Sunday morning and or Sunday night. One of those two at least. If you've been witnessing to somebody, do everything you can to get them out here on this Sunday. And I'm telling you, the more people we get here who need a miracle from God, the greater the miracle is going to be on Sunday. Can you say amen? amen. Why don't you lift a hand right where you're seated and ask God to make our witness effective the next several days and to help us fill this place up on Sunday. Would everybody pray? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that you'd make our witness effective. God, that everybody that we invite, that you would let it take root in their spirit and put a desire in their heart to come and be a part of Sunday services. I pray, Lord God, that, you'd, that you would cause neighbors and people we're teaching Bible study too, and co-workers and, and fellow students, oh God. I, I pray, God, that you'd just start working on their hearts right now, Lord, that we could get them to be here with us this Sunday so you could do great things among us in these services. Everybody said, in Jesus' name, and amen. God bless you. Pre-service prayer every Sunday evening at 5.30. Pre-service prayer, 5.30 Sunday evening. And we feel so strongly about this that if nobody comes at 5.30, we're going to start having pre-service prayer at 6. And we'll start singing at 6.30. But we're going to have a praying church. Amen. We're going to have a praying church. 
And so be here if you can, 5.30 on Sunday evening. Now the elders will be up here every service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every single service they'll be up here anointing with oil. And if you need anointed and prayed for, there's two blessings connected to anointing and prayer. One blessing is that God will heal you. The Bible said the prayer of faith will save the sick. But that's not the end of it. It goes on and says, and if they've committed sin, it shall be forgiven them. Whether you need a physical or a spiritual healing, you can get it at this altar when the elders, according to the scripture, anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith over you. Somebody said amen. amen. So Sunday night, we're all going to pray, be praying. The elders will be here before every single service. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise I'm teaching tonight on the subject to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. When you turn to your neighbor and tell him, I want to be like Jesus. Now, I read an article this week by a pastor that said it's impossible to be like Jesus. That when people talk about being like Jesus, they're wasting their time, wasting their breath. They're saying something they're never, ever going to be able to do, and he never expected us to do it. I'm going to prove that wrong tonight from the Scripture, not my opinion, from the Scripture. He wants us to be like him. Come on, somebody. He wants us to be like him. Now, do we always accomplish it? We don't. Sometimes we get there and fall back down, have to start over again, and that's all okay. The Bible said that a, a, a good man falls, what is it, seven times and gets up again. You know, the, the most important thing is that you get up one more time than you fall down. That is the most important thing. Get up one more time than you fall down. Somebody said amen. You know, people don't want amen statements like that because they think everybody around them will think they've been falling a lot lately. But say amen now and then. Amen. All right, there we go. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you. And this is the fourth lesson in my holiness series I've been bringing to you. I think they told me it's got over 40,000 views of what we've done so far in this holiness series. And I'm thankful for all of that. First of all, let's read John 13, 15. And if you don't have your Bible with you, it is going to be on the screen. John 13 and 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. That's Jesus speaking. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. 1 John chapter 2 and 6. If you'll turn there, both of these are my text for tonight. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 6. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Whosoever says he abides in Jesus ought as a personal debt to walk and conduct himself in the same way in which Jesus walked and conducted himself. If you say that you are a Christian, if you say that you walk with the Lord, if you say that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, then this verse says we ought to walk and conduct ourselves in the same way in which Jesus walked and conducted himself. Somebody say, he's my example. He's my example. Tell somebody again, I want to be like him. We often use five words around the church to describe ourselves uh, and our relationship with God. There's five things, and people say it all the time. Uh, number one, people claim to be a Christian. Anybody in here claim to be a Christian? Let me see your hand. Wave your hand at me. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. People claim to be godly. Anybody in here ever felt like you were a godly individual? Wave your hand at me, would you? There's nothing wrong with waving. That don't like, that ain't going to get you in trouble with heaven or nowhere else. If you. <laughs> Number three, there's a lot of people say we're a holy people. We believe in holiness. We're a holy body. Anybody in here believe in holiness? Okay. Number four, there's a lot of folks that say they're sanctified. Have you noticed that? Especially the old timers. The old timers used to say, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't believe that, but that's what they used to say. You can't be saved before you get the Holy Ghost. 
It's impossible. So you can't be saved, sanctified, then filled with the Holy Ghost. Whew. You know, life would be a lot easier if it wasn't for this book right here. <laughs> Teaching would be a lot easier if we could just make stuff up as we go. <laughs> All right. The fifth one is disciple. How many of you are a disciple? I hope everybody. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. Wave your hand. These are five terms that we use very often. I wonder how many of us actually know what the terms mean. Let me look at them individually. First of all, the word Christian. The general definition of a Christian is a person who believes in Christianity. That is the general definition of a Christian. A person who believes in Christianity. That's an American interpretation, if you please, or definition of the word Christian. The scriptural reference is in book, the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse number 26, mentions that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch or in Antioch. First called Christians in Antioch. That's a whole message all by itself because Christianity didn't begin at the 11th chapter of the book of Acts. They all got the Holy Ghost back in the second chapter of the book of Acts. They heard about power in Acts 1 and 8. There's a lot of good things been happening all the way since back then. It's not my message tonight, but I do think it's unique that it was 11 chapters later before they were actually called Christians. They were first called Christians at Antioch in chapter 11. Now, here's the most important definition. It's the Bible meaning of a Christian. The Bible meaning of a Christian is this, a follower of Christ who emulates his teachings and life. A follower of Christ who emulates his teachings and life. I'm going to underscore that one more time. A follower of Christ who emulates, mimics his teaching and life. Let's go on to the word godly. I think we have slides for those, for all of these back there. Let's go to the word godly. The general definition of the word godly is piously reverent and devout, showing reverence to God. Again, an American dictionary definition of the word godly. The scripture reference is in 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, have nothing to do with godless myths. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Godliness has value for all things. Somebody said amen. amen. The Bible meaning of the word godly is a way of living that implies devotion to God and that reflects. Everybody says reflects. The last definition had the word emulates in it. This definition has the word reflects in it and that reflects the character and the teachings of God. If you understand all that, say amen. amen. Then the word holiness, let's hurry through this. The word holiness, the general definition is dedicated or consecrated to God, sacred. Dedicated or consecrated to God, something that's sacred. The scriptural reference is, I use it often, 1 Peter 1 and 16, be ye holy for I am holy, saith the Lord. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Now, the Bible meaning is this. Set apart from sin. To embody. Everybody say embody. We've had emulate. We've had reflect. Now we got embody. To embody God's purity and righteousness. What does it mean to embody? It means that you become in your body, in your person. You become in this instance, God's purity and righteousness. Go on to the word sanctified. The general definition of the word sanctified is made holy or consecrated, set apart for sacred use. The scripture reference is John 17, 17. Jesus prays, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by thy truth. The Bible meaning is, a process of being made holy through adherence to God's truth. Reflect, embody, all of these words is being used. Now we're using the word adherence. 
adhering to God's truth. And then last of all is the word disciple. General definition is someone who adopts the ideas and follows the practices of their mentor or teacher. If you look up the word disciple in an American dictionary, it'll say a learner. That's usually, it's not always, but it's usually the very first definition, a learner. The definition here given is someone who adopts the ideas and follows the practices of their mentor or teacher. The scripture reference is Matthew 28, 19, 20. Jesus gives the great commission to his disciples and says in that, therefore go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, what am, I trying to, what am I trying to say here? What am I trying to get across to you? The Bible meaning of this word disciple is a learner or a follower of the teachings and the ways of Jesus Christ. Think about each of these definitions that in a sense are all saying the same thing whether you're using the word I'm a Christian or I'm godly or I'm holy or I'm sanctified or I'm a disciple, it all comes back to the same thing. Am I trying to be like him? Is he my example? Is he the one I'm pursuing? Is what he is what I want to be? If you understand all that, say amen. amen. Those of us who have been around the church, and this is the reason for the Bible study, for about two weeks I've been either humming or singing that old, old, old song, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I only ask that I could be like him. It really ought to be the prayer of everybody that loves him. It ought to be the prayer of everybody that wants to please him. It ought to be the prayer of everybody that wants to live for him of every person that's trying to emulate him, of every person that's trying to mimic him, of every person that wants people to see him through you. This is it right here, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. On earth I long just to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I only ask that I could be like him. You see, when you say to be like Jesus, you're saying, I want to be a Christian. Because the definition of Christian is really Christ-like. Christ-like. I'm being like Jesus Christ. That's what a Christian is. A Christian isn't somebody that checks the box on the 10-year survey that's given out here in America. When they do that, that, that what do they call that? They don't call it a survey. A census. And then they say, oh, 78% of the population are Christians. That means of 370 million people, almost 80% of them are saying they're a Christian. There's a whole lot more to being a Christian than just saying it. There's a whole lot more to being a Christian than just going to church. If just sitting in a church makes you a Christian, go sit in your, gar in your garage and see if it makes you a car. It don't do it. Hello? You, you, you can't just come to church and be a Christian. Well, preacher, then how do I do it? Christ-like. I've got to start working on being like him. I want to be like Jesus. Can somebody say amen? amen. There are so many so-called, that's a nice way to say it, so many so-called Christians in our world who willingly look like the world, but call themselves Christ-like. Hello? They do it by their own will. Nobody's making them do it. There's, there's a lot of so-called Christians that talk like the world, but call themselves a Christian. There's a lot that embrace and follow the world, call themselves a Christian. There's a lot that think like the world. You know, there's a reason the Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You literally have to go to battle to make sure your brain don't conform to what this world thinks and believes. 
Can somebody say amen? amen. There's too many so-called Christians that love what the world loves. And still think they're a Christian. There's too many that even defends worldliness and call themselves a Christian. Quiet in here now, isn't it? First John chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 17. They'll be up on the screen one at a time. First John 2, 15 says, Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts nor the things that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hello? Hello? How many of you men think you could convince your wife you love the lady that lives down the street, but you still love her, your wife? I wouldn't go to sleep if I was you. After fighting that fight. Hello? You can't do it. You can't love, the Bible said, God and mammon. Sweet and bitter water don't come out of the same fountain. A fig tree don't produce grapes. And the examples there over and over and over again in the scripture that no man can have two masters. You're going to love the one and hate the other. You're going to hate the one and love the other. You cannot love the world and love God at the same time. You can love the world and enjoy going to church at the same time. You can love the world and sing at the same time. You can love the world and fellowship at the same time. You can love the world and come and hang out with us at the same time. You can love the world and have a job in the church. At the same time, you can love the world and pay your tithes and give offerings to missionaries at the same time. But you can't love the world and love God at the same time. Amen? That's not me. That's what the book says. Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world... Not me. I didn't say this. God said it. The love of the Father is not in him. Hello? Verse 16. Let's go on. Next slide. For all that is in the world. And then he tells us what that is. The lust and sensual craving of the flesh. And the lust and longing of the eyes. And the boastful pride of life pretentious confidence in one's resources or in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world. Hello? You want to know a definition of worldliness? Whenever someone says, oh, you know, you don't need to love the world, and you may be thinking, I don't even know what they're talking about when they say that. There it is right there. Verse number 16, the definition of worldliness is found right there. Let's go to verse 17. Next slide. It said the world passing away. The world's going to pass away. The Bible said with a fervent heat. The world is passing away. Some of us might argue it's passing away before our very eyes right now. The world is passing away. And with it, it's lust. The shameful pursuits and ungodly longings. But the one who does the will of God and carries out his purposes lives forever. So what do we take away from this? You can't on one hand have a grip on the world and the other hand have a grip on God. You're going to get torn apart. It's not going to work. You can't love on one hand the things of the world and love on the other hand the things of God. You can't love the world Monday through Saturday and love God all day Sunday and Wednesday evening. Hello? You've got to get on one side or the other. It's like the Old Testament statement that is quoted so often, who's on the Lord's side? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. There's a point where that if you want to be right with God, you got to make some decisions. 
This idea that I can do anything I want to do, be anything I want to be, go anywhere I want to go, act any way I want to act, look any way I want to look, talk any way I want to talk, and still be a Christian just don't muster with the Scripture. Can you say amen, somebody? If we don't make up our minds to be like Jesus first and foremost, if we don't cross that line in our brain, I want to be like Jesus. Say, preacher, you're gonna, are you perfect? I'm not. Neither are you. None of us do it all the time. None of us ever don't. I'd say everybody in the building goes to bed probably once a week thinking, boy, I wish I wouldn't have said that today. Man, I'm wishing I wouldn't have done that today. Boy, I'm wishing I wouldn't have acted that way today. Boy, I'm wishing I wouldn't have. Am I right or wrong? Am I the only one here that's. Maybe y'all need to be teaching me. Listen to me when I tell you. You've got to get it in your mind. I'm not perfect and I won't be as long as I'm in the flesh. But here's what I want everybody to know. I've drew a line and I'm not going to cross that line on purpose if I can keep from it. And if I, and if I do step across it, I'm going to hurry and get back where I ought to be. Why, preacher? Because I've decided I want to be like Jesus. Amen? Here's what happens if you compromise that to be like Jesus. If you make a compromise, the world will influence what you love and what you don't love. The world's not allowed to determine what you love and don't love as a Christian. I want that to sink in just for a second. I was listening to a psychologist on the radio. And this lady calls in. She's crying. No joke. This is a true story. She calls in crying. Said, my dad. My dad was mean to me. My dad was ugly to me. My dad did this. My dad did that. My dad wasn't loving to me. And the psychologist said, you need to write your father a letter and tell him just how much you hate him. How much he hurt you. How much wrong he's done to you. Now that's the way the world thinks. It is not the way a Christian's supposed to think. And that lady on the phone that is crying, true story. She said, but my dad's dead. I can't tell him. And the psychologist, these are the idiots that need psychologists more than anybody on the face of the earth. The psychologist said, write him a letter and go tape it to his tombstone. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Write him a letter and go tape it to his tombstone. Folks, you can't let worldly thinking take over your Christian mind. That's one of a million examples. You got to be careful that you are not more like the world than you are like Jesus. Hello? I hear Christians all the time say, I don't get mad, I get even. That's real Christian, ain't it? Oh, I can, I can tell you right now who did, just by the way you went. <laughs> I know every one of you. You just told on yourself. You know what you ought to do in a Bible study like this? You ought to sit like this. <laughs> the whole Bible study. Then nobody knows. Listen to me when I tell you. The world thinks it's all right for you to go home with another man's wife. In fact, do you know what the big deal is now is that husbands and wives are agreeing to have what they call an open marriage. He can sleep with anybody he wants to. She can sleep with anybody they want to. And it's all okay. You're allowed to be married and date at the same time. I'm telling you, if you're not careful, you will adopt worldly thinking. And worldly thinking is contrary to Christianity. Hello? Ooh, Jesus. If you're not careful, the world will influence where you go and where you don't go. If you're not careful, the world will influence how you act. If you're not careful, the world will influence your values and your priorities. If you're not careful, when you allow worldliness to get into your spirit, the world will influence our music. That's not the end of my statement. It'll influence our music, and then we will influence the music in church. We'll make it more worldly. 
Hello? Hello? We've got to be careful that we draw a very real line. We build a very real wall. I don't want worldliness in my life. I don't want to be worldly. I don't want to think worldly. I don't want to be influenced by worldliness. I want to have the mind of Christ. Say amen, somebody. The world will influence our decisions. Isn't it amazing how many times in one year we are faced with a decision and we know that's what God wants, but we know this is what's being offered. And oh my Lord, doesn't that look beautiful, what's being offered? Doesn't that seem like that'll be a blessing? Doesn't that seem like it'll be an easier road? Don't that seem like it'll make me smarter, richer? Hello? But I know over here is the will of God. If you're not careful, you can become so worldly that you stop following what you know to be the will of God and you start giving in to worldly thinking and decisions. You know, the things I've been teaching on holiness, this is the fourth lesson. It had been a whole lot easier for y'all if I'd have made up one of them do's and don't lists that the old timers did. Don't do this, do that, don't do this, do that. It'd been easier than what I've been teaching. Because what I'm teaching is how you can figure out how to please God on your own. How you can determine what's right and wrong. How you can know in your spirit when you're on the wrong road or you're on the right road. Can somebody say amen? we got to be careful or else the world will influence how we think. The world will influence what we believe. The world will decide what we should stand for and stand against. The world will influence our finances. The world will influence the depth of our commitment to God. The world will influence and change our pulpits and our messages and the way we interpret Scripture. What are you trying to say? Let me boil it all down to this. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Can you say amen, someone? No wonder that John wrote that in 1 John 2 and 15, what I just quoted to you. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I love our singing. We got great singing in our church, but I fuss at our musicians and singers every now and then. Sing an old song now and then. About 90% of our new songs is bless me, bless me, Lord. Bless me, bless me, Lord. I want to be happy. Let me tell you the world we're living in today. Happiness is killing us. Happiness is destroying us. The pursuit of worldly happiness is destroying Christianity in so many circles today. Isn't it the will of God for me to be happy? I suppose God would rather have you happy than sad. But He'd rather have you sad than lost. Here's something for you to stew on. This isn't in my notes. I'm not even up walking around. But this isn't in my notes. Listen to me carefully. You want to know how God feels about this? He said if your hand offends you, cut it off. Better to go to heaven with one hand than go to hell with both. If your eye offends you, he said pluck it out. Better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with both. Don't you ever test God. God, can I have this or can I have that? Or God, I'm not going to give up this, but I'm still going to go to church. I'm still going to sing in the choir. I'm still going to teach a class, but bless your heart, I'm not doing that. Guess what? He told us how serious he is about it. That if you got to pluck out an eye to be saved, and I don't think you have to, don't nobody be dumb enough to walk out of here tonight and say, preacher said, Hello. But I'm telling you, he was making the point that ain't nothing worth going to hell over. Nothing is worth going to hell over. 
Say amen. amen. According to the Touch Bible Dictionary, the word world, in that love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for if any man love the world. If you look up that word world, it means this. Number one, two meanings. Number one, the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. That's definition number one. The second definition is earthly goods, endowments, riches, advantages, pleasures, etc., which although hollow and frail and fleeting, they stir desire, they seduce from God and are obstacles to the cause of Christ. Don't let anything come between you and being a Christian. Don't let anything come between you and being a Christian. Say amen. amen. Now, one of the most important doctrines in the Bible is the doctrine of separation. We don't talk about it enough in the church. I'll be honest with you. We don't talk about separation enough. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, in the Amplified Version, it says, So, number one, come out from among unbelievers, and number two, be separate. Everybody said, says, says the Lord. And number three, do not touch what is unclean. Number four, or A, he said, and I will graciously receive you and welcome you with favor, and I will be B, a father to you, and you will be my C, sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Listen to what he's saying. Come out from among unbelievers. Be what? Separate. We're not supposed to look like them. I want that to sink in for a second. We're not supposed to look like them. We're not supposed to talk like them. We're not supposed to let their evil habits have control of our Christian life. We're not supposed to be so wrapped up in the things of the world that we want the things of the world more than we want Christ. And we will pursue the things of the world to, loot, to the point of losing out with Christ. Come ye out from among them or among unbelievers and be separate. I want to point out to you too in one verse or in those two verses I should say. 17 and 18. Look what it says. Twice it, the words are put in there says the Lord. I think the last one says the Lord Almighty. Twice in that text, it's emphasizing, this ain't John writing, this ain't Paul writing, this ain't Simon Peter writing, this isn't some man's idea. They wanted to get it across. These things are what God is saying. Hello? Separations means a Christian don't talk like the world. Separation means a Christian don't act like the world. Separation means a Christian don't dress like the world. Separation means a Christian doesn't conform to the world. I don't care what their new little phrases are. I don't care what their new little groups are. I don't care what the Supreme Court does. I don't care what's coming out of the White House or the State House. It don't matter. There's one thing going to make the decision what I believe. One single thing is going to make the decision of what I believe. I'm a whole... Some of you may not like this. But I am a whole lot more committed to being biblically correct than I am politically correct. If I'm not politically correct for you, big deal. I want to be biblically correct, though. I want to be right before Him. And part of that is, it means I've made my mind up, I'm not going to conform to the world. I don't care if it is okay out there for men to date men, and women to date women, and now get married. I don't care. I'm going to go by this book. It don't matter to me what they're thinking, what they're saying. 
Now, there's a lot of churches, and yes, you heard me right, churches. There's a lot of churches in our town. I couldn't say what I just said in a church. Hello? It don't matter to me what they think about it. You know, they got this deal. I don't know if you've uploaded the new iPhone update. If you did, it's going to make you mad because it's got men in there that's pregnant as little emojis. Men that are pregnant. Somebody said, can a man have a baby? Absolutely not. Hello? So what about a woman that now identifies as a man? I identify as a monkey, but it ain't going to change me. I identify as a millionaire, but I'm poor as Job's turkey. This idea, you know, let me pick on Rick. Rick, how much you weigh? You're lying. You told me more than that in a car the other day. <laughs> you said in the car to me and Cecil, I'm pushing 200 right now. <laughs> okay, there's a perfect example right there. It's a 200 pound man identifying as 185. But if we go get a scale, it don't matter what you identify as. Hello? I've seen little kids here in the church going around acting like they're a dog. Woof, 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 woof. That make them a dog? No. Oh, you can get mad, get bent out of shape, do whatever you want. I'm going to take a stand for the Bible no matter who likes it or who don't. We're going to follow the Word of God. Don't you love this deal now where they, these so-called big deals on TV and all that, and news reporters are saying, what is a woman anyway? I heard an old African-American preacher about three or four weeks ago he opened it up to questions in his church and, and someone recorded it and put it out on social media. And they asked him, said, what is a woman? That old man said, yo, mama's a woman. <laughs> I said, good for you. You want to know what a woman is? Your mother's a woman. Your dad's not a woman. I don't care if he puts a dress on. Amen. Might make him a fruity man, but it won't make him a woman. <laughs> Say, preacher, what are you doing? I'm trying to explain in maybe a little bit of a funny term that folks, we either believe the book or we don't. We're either Christians, we're either committed to truth and righteousness or we're not. We can't act like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, believe like the world, and still be Christians. It's impossible. Say amen, somebody. A Christian doesn't do what comes natural to the world. A Christian doesn't think like the world. A Christian doesn't prioritize what the world prioritizes. A Christian doesn't love what the world loves. Hello? Joe Biden, did you, read the, did you read the deal? Last week, I, Joseph A. Biden, President of the United States of America, do hereby declare that Sunday, March 31st, Easter Sunday, is going to be trans, what was it, recognition day. On Monday, I heard him coming out of the White House. I was watching it online. And all the news reporters there, and one of them said, Sir, are you worried about the Christians that you've offended by doing this on Sunday? You know what he did? I didn't do that. I said, oh, yes, sir, you put out a presidential. No, I didn't do no such thing. I got news for you, folks. You can swallow the Kool-Aid if you want to. And I don't, don't you dare think, oh, he's pushing Trump. I think Trump's the biggest sinner that ever lived in the White House. Now you all got quiet. Look at you. Look at you. You're grinning when I'm talking about Biden. When I talk about Trump, y'all get mad. Listen when I tell you, 
You don't get to be a high up politician without selling your soul to this world. It's impossible. I know them. I've been there. I've been to the White House. I've run with politicians. I've had dinner with them here. My staff can tell you they flew in to have me pray for them in my office, right? Come here for to be prayed for. Wrote a letter to the White House and said, you got to have Pastor Cunningham come and do devotions in the White House. I know him. I'll help him if I can. But I'm telling you, it don't matter what you think you belong to. It is worldly. We don't belong to this world. We've got a home on the other side. We've got a home on the other side. The old timers used to sing, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. Whoa, hallelujah. I'm fixing to preach. Say, preacher, you're going to make people mad. Didn't get mad. It don't matter to me if next month we have 5,000 viewers. We're going to believe the word of God. The Word of God's got to be the final authority among Christian people. Can you say amen? amen. Come on, say amen. amen. You see, I think every apostolic believer should wear 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 like a badge of honor. 1 Peter 2 and 9 said, but you are a chosen generation. Do you, do you understand that about yourself? You're not a nobody. You're not a nothing. You're not some scallywag. You're not some piece of dirt to be kicked around. You're not something that's down in the mully grubs and ain't ever going to get out. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That verse right there, someone says, what do you believe? Who are you? Who do you think you are? Right there ought to be your answer. Right there ought to be your... You want to know why I'm trying to live for Him? You want to know why I drew lines? You know why I'm not going to act like the world? I'm a, I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a holy nation. I'm a special people. I was designed by God to proclaim the praises of Him that called me out of darkness into His marvelous light. Can you say amen, somebody? The Bible doesn't tell us only to be like Jesus, but it clearly and concisely tells us how to be like Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 21, it says, For even here unto were you called. In modern day English, that would mean now this is why you're called. This is what you're called to. Okay? For even here unto were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us. Leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Did anybody get that? He's our example. And we're supposed to walk like he walked. We're supposed to follow his steps. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6 in the Amplified Bible, it says, Whoever says he abides in him ought as a personal debt to walk and conduct himself in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked and conducted himself. I read it to you before. I'm reading it again. It tells us exactly how. How we're supposed to be a Christian. It doesn't say you can do whatever the flesh wants to do and still be a Christian. I know this is 2024. I know you can watch every so-called Christian TV show on TV and you ain't going to hear stuff like this. I understand that. Do you understand that we're one God apostolic, tongue-talking, holy-rolling born again, heaven bound believers. We're Jesus name people. We're Bible loving people. Say amen. I wonder how it would impact our Christian walk if we would starting ask, if we'd start asking questions like, before we do something, if we would ask, what would Jesus do? 
what would Jesus do? Now, we do ask questions. And the reason I know is because I'm the one who gets some of them. People call me, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I go here? Can I go there? Most of those questions are, Pastor, how close can I get to the world and you still consider me saved? That's really the synopsis of those questions. Pastor, can I go to this movie? Can I go to this bar? You know, all my buddies go to the bar. I promise I won't drink. The Bible said, don't let your good be evil spoken of. Hello? I'm always being asked questions. Can I stick my foot through the fence, preacher, and still be saved? Hello? What if we started asking ourselves, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Someone says, hey, you want to go to the bar with me? And you think, what would Jesus do? Somebody said, hey, let's go down here and look at this beautiful woman. This woman will go with anybody. What would Jesus do? And what would my wife do to me when she finds out about it? Hello? What about what would Jesus say when you say something? What would Jesus say? How about how would Jesus act? How about would Jesus go there? How about would Jesus be influenced by that person? How about would Jesus listen to that kind of talk? Music, wording. How about would Jesus watch that? Here's one's going to make you mad. Would Jesus endorse what I endorse? Hmm? Hello? It ought not be a drudgery. It ought not to be work. It ought not be a hardship for a child of God to befriend who Jesus would befriend. The kind of person Jesus would befriend. Or to refuse to go where Jesus would not go. Or to love what Jesus loves. Here's another one to make us mad. Or hate what Jesus hates. Listen how quiet it is. Sounds like Joe Biden, didn't I? I was whispering there. I said this one time to a person that, you know, we need to love what Jesus loves. We need to hate what Jesus hates. And he stopped me and said, Jesus don't hate nothing. There's no hate in him. I said, really? It's not what the Bible says. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 said, These six things doth God hate. Seven are an abomination unto him. What are those seven things? Number one, a proud look. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, hands that shed innocent blood. Number four, a heart that devises wicked imaginations. Number five, feet that be swift to running to mischief. Uh, number six, a false witness that speaketh lies. And number seven, remember he said he hates six things and seven's an abomination. Here's number seven. He that soweth discord among the brethren. Hello. I think not only we need to love what he loves, we need to hate what he hates. Wow, wow, wow. Either y'all went to sleep or left or something. Quiet in this place. You know, you got to be careful, folks, that a compromising, that a compromising world, even religious world, isn't determining for you what you believe and don't believe. You got to be careful that you're not taking your cues from a charismatic preacher, a charismatic program. Hello? Tell a preacher they sing just like us. Yeah, they do. Some of them worship just like us. Yeah, they do. But if you listen to what they're preaching, they're not preaching like us. They're not preaching what the Bible says strictly. Oh, boy, 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 boy. 
Here's my, I'm getting close to the end. Here's kind of where I'm going. If you cannot imagine Jesus doing something, if you can't imagine Jesus saying something, if you can't imagine Jesus being influenced by something or someone, if you can't imagine Jesus loving something, if you can't imagine Jesus embracing something, if you can't imagine Jesus accepting something, if you can't imagine Jesus endorsing something, if you can't imagine Jesus entertain, entertaining something, then I'm thinking a Christian shouldn't be doing it either. Hello? How is it we can claim to be Christian doing things we know Christ wouldn't do? Are we here? Striving to be like Jesus involves both an inner transformation and an outward conversion. You've heard me say it many times that when the inside's right, the outside will automatically get right. And when the outside's not right, it's usually an indicator that the inside's not right. There's got to be a inner transformation and an outward conversion. You've got to first make the commitment on the inside, in your mind and in your heart, what you're going to love, what you're going to think, what you're going to believe. You've got to make those decisions first. And then it has to show on the outside of you, how you talk, how you act, how you dress, where you go, who you're with. It's got to show on the outside. That's what real Christianity is all about. Can I get an amen? amen? If we really want to be like Jesus, there are seven doable steps, decisions, and changes that can help us to be more like him. Let me very quickly, I've got 11 minutes left, six minutes left. I'll go very quickly. Number one, study the life, attitudes, actions, and decisions of Jesus. Study Jesus. Read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four of them are about the life and times of Jesus Christ. It'll help you to understand his teachings, his actions, his interactions with others. Can somebody say amen? amen. Number two, pray for guidance. Pray for guidance. Ask God to guide you in the decisions that you've got to make and tell him, I want my decisions to honor you. Help me with that, Lord. Number three, practice love and compassion. Practice love and compassion. Practice loving kindness. Show compassion to others. Do acts of good service. Serve other people. Acts of kindness. Be a forgiver. That's number four. Forgive others. Forgive others. I don't have time to... To, to spend any time here, but we've all got to learn that part of Christianity is forgiving those that have done us wrong. The greatest example of that in the world is Jesus hanging on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It was his example before us to forgive those. He, he for, I told the folks the other day, the elders, all the elders were in my living room and we we're sitting around talking last night. Third Thursday, I think it was, or Friday. We're all sitting around talking. We got to talking about the forgiveness of God. And I said, don't you ever let anybody tell you that God is not a forgiving God. They are lying to you if they say God is not a forgiving God. Look at, look at Judas. Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him. He knew that Judas was going to sell him for 30, sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. And then all of those days leading up to death on a cross was in front of him. He knew what Judas was going to do. But the Bible said at the Last Supper, he took the bread, he dipped it in the mutton juice. That's what they called the sop. He put the bread in the juice and he handed it out to Judas, which was something you only did to like a child or a grandchild or, or a husband or a wife or someone you were just intimately loved, somebody that you carefully loved, you deeply loved. He dips the sop and hands it to Judas and says, friend. Does he not know what Judas is going to do? Sure he does. But it was one more attempt at, come on, Judas. Come on, Judas, we're friends. I love you. I'm not going to give up. Come on, Judas. I want to present to you something. You, I ain't got no way of proving this and you got no way of proving me wrong. 
I am a firm believer that if Judas would have repented, God would have forgave him the same as he forgave Simon Peter that denied him three times. Don't you let anybody make our God a God that is unforgiving, a God that doesn't care, a God that's hard-hearted, a God that is, is just out to get you. That's not the God that we serve, folks. Come on, somebody. That's not the God we serve. Now, you're all clapping because you believe that. But he said, you got to forgive like I forgive. And he said, if you don't forgive, I'm not going to forgive you. Hello? Hear, hear me carefully on this sentence right here, and then I'll go on to number five. Listen carefully. You are never, everybody say never. never. Say it loud, never. never. I'm underlining it, never. You are never any closer to being like Jesus than when you're forgiving. That's what he was all about. That's what he was known for more than anything. It's what, he, it's what he came to the world for. I come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hello? He was a forgiving, a forgiving Savior, a caring Savior. And you are never any more like him than when you're forgiving. And you're never any more unlike him when you're being vengeful and hateful and unforgiving. Hello? Everybody still here? Number five. You want to be more like Jesus, serve others. Serve others. Jesus taught that serving others is the path to greatness in the kingdom of God. Three different times Jesus said a version of, he that would be the greatest among you, let him be the servant of all. It is the only place in the Bible that tells us how to be great. There is no other scripture in your Bible that says, do this and you'll be great. But three times it says, he that would be the greatest among you, let him be the service. He that is the greatest among you will be the servant. Three different ways he said the same thing. That greatness is a result of serving others. Can you say amen? amen. Look for opportunities to serve, to serve your family, to serve the church, to serve the community, to serve neighbors, to serve strangers. Look for opportunities to serve. Number six, cultivate 10 spiritual disciplines. Ten spiritual disciplines. I think if you'll go to the next slide, I think they're listed. There you go. Take a picture of that. Cultivate ten spiritual disciplines. Number one, faith. Number two, prayer. Number three, fasting with prayer. This kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. Doesn't do no good to fast and not pray. Fasting and prayer is what works. Number four is holiness. Number five is Bible study. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Number six is church attendance. Don't need to talk about that. We look at the crowd we got on a Wednesday night. Number seven is worship. Worship. Be a worshiper. Number eight is witnessing. Number nine is stewardship. And number ten is faithfulness. Ten spiritual disciplines. That every Christian should cultivate. Number seven. Develop a living faith. A living faith. Faith should influence all areas of our life. Every area of your life should be impacted by faith. Our faith should determine our day-to-day -day choices. Our faith should determine our priorities. Our faith should determine our long-term decisions. Our faith should determine what we love. Our faith should determine where we go. Our faith should determine what and who we allow to influence us. Our faith should determine who we date and marry. Got all the young people in here today. Our faith should determine how we spend our money. Our faith should determine who and what we follow. Our faith should determine how we raise our children. Our faith should determine our allegiance. Our faith should determine who and what we support. Our faith should determine how we respond. Our faith should determine our future. And our faith should be considered in every single decision. 
My Bible study tonight is to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. Anybody here want to be like him? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I love the way the old timers thought about it. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I only ask to be like him. They talked about real life. They talked about the journey. They talked about it's a long process. Hello? I told my mom. My mom's probably watching now. 88 years old. Be 89 December. And when I teach something like this, my mom may call me tonight. Very often she does. And she'll be crying on the phone. She'll say, son, I want to be a Christian. Every time I preach something, you know, son, I want to do what's right. Son, I want to make it. And I generally answer the same way. Mom, if you don't make it, the rest of us shouldn't even try. We just need to throw in the towel, everybody else. But when you got somebody like that, that's crying at 89, almost 89 years old, I want to be like Jesus. When you've got an apostle Paul that's in a prison cell at the end of his life, He's an old man. He's hunchbacked. He can't see. He's been imprisoned. He's been whipped with rods and left for dead. Been stoned and left for dead. Let down over a wall in the middle of the night to run for his life. He's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten three times publicly. He's traveled the then known world as a missionary. He wrote everything we know about the gifts of the Spirit and one more than half of the books in the New Testament. And as an old man dying in a jail cell, he's crying, Oh, that I might know him. Oh, that I might know him. Honey, you don't ever, you don't ever quit searching. You don't ever quit trying to be like him and be more like him. You don't ever stop your pursuit of him. You don't ever get to a place where you think, I got all of him I want. Can you say amen? amen. Would you raise both your hands to heaven and let's love him together. He's so good to us. Father, we love you with all of our hearts, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. We thank you for your goodness. God, we're indebted to you. We're indebted to you for your goodness. We're indebted to you, oh God, for your kindness. We're indebted to you for your word. Help us, God, to be what you want us to be. Not what this world expects of us. Not what people expects of us. Not what culture expects of us. Not what money's trying to make us into or education's trying to make us into. Help us, oh God, to be what you want us to be. I pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Clap your hands to